Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm excited about this next panel. Um, I hope you are too. Um, the two folk next to me need little introduction, so I will give them a little introduction. Um, Baroness Catherine Ashton of Holland uh, was the former uh, High Representative of the European Union on Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Nick Clegg uh, was formerly Deputy Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and is still the MP for Sheffield Hallam. And really excited to be talking with them in conversation over the next hour. Um, we've talked a lot in the session so far about uh, some of the big themes that are challenging governments around the world. We've talked about the structural challenges facing the European Union. We've looked at issues of trust in government and how trust can be fostered. And we've looked at the cohesiveness and diversity of societies. What I'm looking forward to in this session is getting uh, down to talking with two very experienced and very senior practitioners about how that happens, about how governments work, about what works and what does not work in terms of uh, bringing collaboration and cooperation together and achieving uh, significant uh, progress at both the international and the national level. Um, we face a world where, as we've been discussing, there are huge challenges of fracture at the international level, where there are real difficulties in achieving cooperation across some of the most challenging issues facing our global community. And then at the national level, in many different polities, there is a real tension between those who are the leaders of countries and the electorates whom they serve, uh, and, and the citizens um, in countries which are not democratic. And so these two tensions uh, at, the at the national and the international level are part of the backdrop. But as I say, we're looking forward to hearing a little bit from our uh, two speakers about the how. Before we begin, um, as we've done in the other sessions, I'd just like to invite one of our MPP students to give us a framing question, which will allow us to think a little bit as we go through the session about one, one of the burning issues. So, Zara, would you like to pose your question? Thank you both. I'm looking forward to this. So, my question to you is this. What precisely is missing in global leadership? And adjoining that, what skill sets are needed by global leaders and global institutions to address the crises we're facing, both on a domestic and an international level? So, small question to face us for the next hour. What I'd like to do is begin, um, uh, Cathy, I wonder if you could just, for a few minutes, say to, uh, give us your view on the biggest challenges facing the international community and national leaders at this moment in time. Well, I'll just, Callum, just to say it's really nice to be here with such a distinguished group of people and to be with uh, Nick Clegg, who is an extraordinary human being uh, and a great friend. Um, I think the, the biggest issue is that you can't deal with any of the global challenges that are faced alone. And for many domestic audiences and domestic politicians, that's actually incredibly difficult to reconcile with the fact that by nature you are working in a domestic climate. So when leaders come together in informal groupings to resolve problems, in more formal groupings, whether that's in the European Union, in NATO, in the UN, whether it's in the uh, Arab League or it's in any of the international organizations, ASEAN, OIC, etc. They arrive as politicians who are framed by the domestic situation that they face and yet are confronted with challenges that don't stop at borders. And how we move forward to address that, recognizing that they need to keep the link between their domestic audiences for obvious reasons, but also need to be able to think strategically of who, with, who they will cooperate with and how in order to solve the problems. And I think for many political leaders, that's, if you like, in terms of how they think, one of the greatest challenges that they face. Well, so it's a question to you, Nick. Uh, well, well, very, uh, very much in keeping with what uh, Cathy just said. I think, um, in a nutshell, uh, nationally elected governments don't seem capable of dealing with the dark side of globalisation, and people know that, and it makes them very angry. And I can understand why it makes them angry because people feel that their everyday lives are affected by forces which are beyond their control. Um, and they then elect politicians that promise the earth uh, and promise to be able to control these forces, and then, of course, they fail to do so. And so you get this constant cycle of elevated expectations, disappointments, uh, and that then, of course, fosters cynicism, and that, then, of course, is the 
is the sort of petri dish within which uh, nationalism and populism uh, flourishes. Uh, I'll give, just give you two examples. The spectacle from, you know, many of our fellow citizens' points of view, the spectacle of European governments being completely incapable of dealing with the mass movement of people fleeing from conflict in Syria and elsewhere into Europe. Is, is not only very unsettling, it's a sort of, it's, a, it's, a, it's an abject spectacle of downright incompetence. And it was, it, I mean, it is an act of incompetence. It is a very incompetent thing to do, to create a Schengen arrangement where you remove all the internal borders, but you have no external borders. And you can either have no internal borders and some in external borders, or you can have no external borders and some internal borders. What you can't do, which is what the European Union has done, is not have either. And the moment that's brought under pressure by the large movements of people, of course, it makes governments look precisely what they are, which is helpless. And then they take lots of new, you know, barbed wires go up, fences go up, panic ensues. And that, that, you know, that, that, that's very visceral, because then people are thinking, God, this lot who I've elected can't even do the most basic function of the state, which is at some, it doesn't matter where you place the border, but at some point, you have to have some kind of say over who's coming in and who's going out. And one, one other quick example, the banks. Banks blew up in 2008. Uh, people are still paying the consequences of that, people on lower middle incomes. The banks have been sort of slightly sort of been rescued, uh, thanks to the sort of largesse of taxpayers, and yet the banks are still basically operating on a model which is unsustainable economically. We've done a sort of patch and mend job on the banks, but the banks, in my view, have still departed from the core function of the banking system, which is a sort of quasi-utility keeping your money safe, holding it on deposit, lending it prudently. But instead, it's sort of spun out now into a completely different function that sort of creates credit out of sort of thin air and, and, and creates an over-leveraged system. Anyway, I think people kind of intuitively understand that they were not protected in 2008 by regulators and politicians from the misdemeanors in the banks, and that makes people very angry. That's, again, a function of, of a global economic environment which, where people look to their politicians for answers and instead feel that they're left vulnerable to forces beyond their control. And that makes people very angry. I think that's the fundamental problem. And as Cathy quite rightly said, you can't deal with any of those problems unless you do it together with others, which is the single most important skill set, I suggest, that global leaders need to develop. So, I mean, you both set out for us, uh, on the one hand, the challenge of managing the domestic opinion and coming to international negotiations and finding cooperation. And on the other hand, simply big failures of coordination. I'd be interested in both of your reflections on the barriers. So, Nick, you've given us two examples, uh, the migration crisis and banking, and you're suggesting to us that these have been failures. We haven't got it right, and that's created even further mistrust between electorates and their elected representatives. So what are the barriers? Why is it that uh, governments find it so hard to address these big challenges, both at the European level, cooperating on issues like migration, and in some cases at the national level, for example, dealing with national level banking systems? Do you want to go first? Uh, well, I think so. A mi mixture of reasons. Um, uh, in some cases, it is exactly as Cathy says. It's just the unwillingness to um, uh, confront the controversy that is involved politically in, in explaining to your own electorates that... But, and, of course, this is at the heart of this debate we're having in this country now about the referendum, that, that, that by pooling decisions together, you actually empower yourself and by not doing so, you actually disempower yourself. And for one reason or another, and it's an art, not a science, uh, politicians who are generally, uh, certainly in my experience, you know, just being harried from pillar to post from one minute to the next and, 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 and living lives of, you know, rabbit hutch myopia, uh, to, 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 to make those big, those big uh, bold arguments, uh, there's very little space in the kind of hurly-burly and the sort of frenetic neurosis of everyday politics to do so. There are other less uh, forgivable reasons. I think sometimes there are just big vested interests um, which block the change that everyone knows that is necessary. It can either be uh, the vested interests we, you know, in certain industrial sectors who don't want sort of to, to see their vested interests challenged, or it's vested interests in, in the press who, 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 who intimidate politicians um, uh, and, and, and wield huge clout and prevent politicians from doing the brave things that they know in their hearts they need to do. So it's a mixture of different reasons, I suspect. Yeah, 
I, I mean, it, it, you know, domestic politicians arrive in their domestic lives with uh, often a focus on their own local communities that they kind of raise up to being about their country and doing the best things that they can for the, the people that they represent. They also focus mainly on things like social security, uh, you know, issues to do with education, with health, with the things that uh, they've been elected to do by their populations. And if you look at what is on the top of the list of everyone as to why they elect their politicians, it's a very clear list. In most countries, it's pretty much the same. And I don't think we should underestimate how big some of the challenges that people now face really are. My experience was that we were often overwhelmed, in a sense, by things that were changing so dramatically and so quickly in places where we had an interest in helping to support stability, security for people, and helping them move forward. They were not predictable forces, or at least as far as I could see they weren't. Sometimes people in hindsight say they were predicted, but hey, I never saw anything at the time. And dealing with them requires often, if you're going to collaborate, a quite measured approach. If you're going to pool what you do, whether you call it pooling ideas or pooling the way in which you go about it, if you're going to work together to bring security through pooling your police force operations or having customs officers operating across different countries. You have to work out the rules of engagement, if you like. Who are they? How are they going to do it? What is the job that they're going to be given? How will they be transported? Who's going to pay for them? And so on. I'm not making excuses for this, but it's very difficult, as I see it, when you are working collaboratively to learn to move as quickly as you need to. And I think we see that all the time in different places, not just in Europe, actually, but in many other parts of the world. But that capacity to be able to move at speed to address a problem when you need to have worked out what it is you're doing is going to be with us longer. And one of the things that certainly I worked on was reducing the time, using what we knew to kind of automatically be able to be used again. And that's not easy for all sorts of reasons I won't bore you with but it's actually crucial to do it. The other point I'd make is that sometimes things are created for a different purpose. The internal movement of people is an internal proposition. It was never in, uh, envisaged when it was done that it would also be about what happens when lots of people who are fleeing the most tragic of circumstances then wish to be engaged with and come into those countries. And so, Finding a response to all of these problems is often at best done with a kind of you know, patch and mend, as Nick described it. Let's just try and make something worthwhile. And then you start to see the beginnings of a longer term strategy. And the real challenge for politicians who, in the main, I know they get a rotten press, but in the main, really do want to do the right things for people, uh, they are human beings often thrust into a situation that is beyond what they expected to be dealing with. If you talk to some of them now dealing with some of these issues, uh, I don't make excuses for them, but it is incredibly difficult to work out what to do, is to try and move from that initial response, which you're trying to, what I call the holding position, to really have a thought out, well-coordinated policy. But back to my point at the beginning, Bear in mind that they also have a very clear perspective on the expectations upon them from their domestic audiences, which may not be the same as they would like to feel. You know, they, they would like perhaps to do things differently, and maybe they're not brave enough, or maybe they're uncertain about their own position. Lots of reasons. But in European terms, you have to also remember that Coalition governments in the UK may be unusual, but in most of Europe, they're the norm. And in those coalitions, you will have a spread of opinion, which also any prime minister, president, whoever, who is dealing with an issue has got to take into account. Because if coalitions collapse, government collapses, and new governments come in, often, shall we say, with a very different perspective 
uh, maybe a more populist perspective, whatever word you wish to use, than those who are outgoing. And so it's not necessarily a good thing if things move in that direction. And all of those balancing acts are part of the art, and it is an art, definitely, not a science, of trying to get sensible decisions made in good time to try and address things, when for all of us watching the tragedy unfold is heartbreaking in the extreme. Thank you both. So we've talked and given a really helpful framework of some of those barriers, if you like, at the sort of general level. I think, you know, consistent with the spirit of the school, which is about looking at practical ways of improving government, I'd love to focus with each of you on an example where it's actually worked. So we've described why it's so hard, but just occasionally there are successes. Um, so Nick, I wonder if you could kick us off. Is, is there an example you can think of either on the domestic or the, or the European or international plane where from your experience in government, something did happen, that these barriers we've just described were able to be overcome? And can you just tell us a little bit about that and, and what you think the skills were that allowed that to happen on that particular occasion? Struggling to think of one, actually. Um, uh, but you, you mean in terms of an international... Uh, yeah. Because um, domestically, there's plenty of examples. Internationally, it's more full. I think... <laughs> no, I can think of some, uh, but let me just pick which one of the rich cornucopia of choices. Uh, uh, so let me give you an example. So, um, 12, 13 years ago, I co-authored a little pamphlet, uh, it wasn't very widely read, I don't think, uh, about um, quite a radical change which has subsequently been introduced across the English school system in effect emulating something that uh, I first observed in Denmark, Sweden and the Netherlands. In effect, it's, a, it's an extra lump of money that is given on an individual basis to children from most disadvantaged backgrounds at school. It's called a pupil premium. Uh, it's having a transformative effect on the education of some of the most disadvantaged kids in this school. It'll, uh, it's being slightly eroded by the new government, but I'll set that aside for a minute. Um, uh, that is a very big structural change in, in the way in which resources are devoted to deal with disadvantage in the school system. Uh, as a person. And I think the, the, um, the, the key delivery of that change is firstly uh, a well-researched idea so that it works. In this case, we were able to, well before I went into government, be able to draw on the experiences of other, other countries. Secondly, building the political case. Uh, and that, in, in that instance, of course, it's very difficult for opponents to uh, deny the ambition of wanting to give uh, you know, kids from the most disadvantaged backgrounds the best opportunity through their education. And then thirdly, just through sort of brute force within the Whitehall jungle to force the um, uh, penny-pinching folk in the treasury to cough up the money, which in my case was just a very, very crude sort of trade-off within a coalition of saying, I insist that this two and a half billion pounds, whatever it is, a year is delivered, and in return, you conservatives can get, I forget what, forget what actually, I genuinely forget what it was, but that's tended, that's tended to be how it worked when there was a battle of, of resources. So I think uh, a clear idea, something which mobilizes um, sort of crop, uh, political support as, as much as you can across the political spectrum, and then making sure that you can you can deliver the resources uh, in support of it. Thank you. So, Cathy, you were credited as um, high rep with a number of really significant breakthroughs, wicked problems that people didn't think could be solved, and you played a significant part in moving some of those forward. Is there, is there one of those that you could share with the audience as an example of how uh, tough challenges really can be cracked? It's very nice of you to say so. I'm not sure if my list goes beyond about three, but there we go. Um, I would perhaps use the, most, the one that, that people often want to hear about most, which is the Iran negotiations. Uh, and um, I'm not going to talk about the detail of them. But the process was very interesting because it began as a European process. Three foreign ministers from France, Britain and Germany, together with the person who did half of what I did, if you get what I mean, because it was a merger of different jobs, but I did a huge amount. Um, uh, working um, on a s initial discussions with the Iranians. So it then converted into what was called the E3 plus 3 if you were European and the P5 plus 1 if you were American. And it was essentially the permanent five members of the Security Council plus 1, which is Germany, because of the initial uh, discussions. 
And just two or three very quick points about why I think it was successful. Um, number one, uh, because this team of people worked closely together in, certainly when I became the, the, the leader of the group, if you like, was a very systematically thought out way of operating. We met, we discussed what our position was, we worked as a team to try and resolve a problem. And we did it with an enormous amount of trust in each other, but also they put an enormous amount of trust in what I was doing. The second was that we gave the process time so that each session, as well as the length of time, I worked on this for over four years, we allowed time to be part of what we did, not because we wanted to delay getting to a decision, but simply when you're meeting to talk about the detail of a negotiation, and any of you who've been involved in them will know the detail in the end becomes the most important element. You need to be able to have in the course of your meetings, time to discuss, reflect, argue, do more than argue if necessary, you know, come back together, work out what to do, call home, etc. And so the process worked because each session was, as you know, two or three days long and sometimes even longer. And it went on until we got to a good conclusion. And I think the third element is that Apart from the people in the room, there were a whole group of nations and people who were cheering us on in the sense of being prepared to support the process by helping keep the pressure on, but by also being prepared to support what we were doing when it became very difficult. Because as you know, we had a change of governments in many of the countries that we were dealing with on our side, if you like, and certainly people in the negotiations changed quite a lot. There was only, I think, Sergei Ryabkov, who's the Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia, and I, who at the end had been at the beginning when I started. He was he'd been in there forever, I think. And certainly, of course, from the Iranians, we had the change from Ahmadinejad to Rouhani, which was the most significant change, if you like, on their side. So process and structure and collaboration and trust and feeling that you're working together with a common purpose are never to be underestimated, ever, when you're trying to do things at any level, because they will be the tools, if you like, that will help you in what will be often very difficult circumstances, actually, break through. Thank you. So the two things strike me from these two different examples. Um, that you described 12 years from a pamphlet to the implementation of a policy, and Cathy was talking about a period of four or five years for the Iranian negotiations. That's unusual. I mean, you both talked when you were talking about barriers, about real time pressures and responsiveness and having to focus on things. So as leaders and as people who were involved in pushing that through and keeping the focus on that, how did you persist on that goal when there were so many other people saying you should be distracted to do something else, that your focus should be elsewhere, that there were other pressing issues? What, what, what are the characteristics of allowing an issue to continue to be at the forefront and therefore be pursued over a number of years rather than being dropped because it just falls into the too difficult to pursue category? ignore everybody else then. <laughs> um, I don't mean that literally, but in the sense that you, you have to believe in what it is you're trying to do. I mean, when I was a minister for Shaw Star, thinking about what mm. Nick did on schools, you know, introducing children's centres, primary education, nursery education, you bang on and on and on for a long, long time before you're in a position, really, to be able to take the ideas or views you have and translate those into real policy, and it's about being in the right place at the right time. So Nick's journey was about becoming Deputy Prime Minister and being able to tell the Treasury that's what he wanted to do, never to be underestimated. Um, for, for me, it was about the fact that this was, and I can think of other examples, of Serbia and Kosovo and the negotiations we did there, the dialogue, the work I did in different parts of the, uh, the Middle East and so on and elsewhere. It's about an understanding, too, that you are prepared to keep going and you are prepared to try and get this to work. Either because in some circumstances the alternatives are not great um, or more likely because you can see that if you continue there is a good chance that you'll be successful. It doesn't mean that there aren't many, many times when you think it's not going to work. 
uh, and not so much in the Iran talks, but in other negotiations. I can remember saying to people, oh, this is hopeless, I'm never going to manage it. And a week later, we did it. You know, yeah. it's, it's often that you're dealing in circumstances like that. Um, and often you're dealing with problems, by the way, as Nick will have done in government, for sure. And I certainly did, both as a government minister and uh, in uh, my role as high rep. You're dealing with much more immediate issues that have to be dealt with there and then, or that week, or yesterday, or whenever. But given the option of being able to put a proper framework around things and really think through what you're doing, the outcome is better uh, in the end, and it's more likely to survive. Well, first of all, I just, I mean, Kath's being ridiculously modest. I mean, it was an astonishing historical achievement that you, that you, uh, that you did on, on all of our behalves, and it was a, an absolute masterclass in strategic patience and diplomatic charm and guile in equal measure. Uh, <laughs> So no, it's, it's ama amazing what, what, what you did, um, uh, and we can really all learn a huge amount from it. I mean, look, first, I think what Cathy just said earlier is true. I mean, politicians, of course, um, are all sort of very quickly caricatured as sort of bloodless, venal, amoral characters. But uh, would you believe that actually politicians are human beings? Um, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, in my experience, from all parties, do start off with real ideals. They believe in stuff. And I know that's very unfashionable, but they do. Now, they might very quickly have that idealism tarnished by the reality of government and so on. But, you know, politicians do b believe in it. And actually, as, as, uh, as, as Cathy said, just believing that what you're doing is the right thing to do is, is, remains, much as in politics and government, just as in life, the most powerful motive um, uh, of all. Secondly, in... Um, in politics, of course, uh, oddly enough, precisely because politics, politics has become, and I think it has become, uh, much, much more uh, frenetic, volatile, noisy, uh, uh, um, and brittle. Uh, in, 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 and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, breakdown of old ideological uh, distinctions, breakdown of class politics, uh, advent of social media. I mean, there are lots of other reasons which need to organise a different session to discuss. Um, but the effect of it on decision makers is that there is now so much permanent 24-hour, seven-day-a-week noise just being thrown at you, like thrown at you permanently. And um, I was talking to Ken Clark, who those of you who are British will know, is a veteran British um, conservative politician. And I asked him, this was a few months ago, I said, you know, was it, was it ever thus? And he said, no, no, it's got considerably worse, this sort of sense of people running to stand still has got considerably worse. And oddly enough, in that context, having a few big things that you hold on to, which are like sort of load stars, which, which allow you to continue to navigate in the direction you want, is incredibly important, because they're, they're the only few fixed points you have. And the third point I'd make is that, um, you know, politicians are quite rightly judged on lots of grounds, but they're also judged on, on their record of, you know, doing what they... Um, said they would, and I, of course, got notoriously uh, hammered for not being able to deliver one of my party's policies on uh, higher education. Um, and that maybe, in my case, increased my determination to actually deliver, well, not that history will ever record it as such, but actually the, the four things we put on the front page of our manifesto didn't include higher education. Never mind, that's not what anyone remembers now. But, um, uh, and they, they, they were, they were uh, just, just by way of example, but well, by way of... Uh, Self-justification, um, but why, by way of example, so the things that we had on the front page of the manifesto six years ago were one, this pupil premium, two, raising the point at which you start paying income tax so that people pay less income tax, particularly on low in, um, end of income. Thirdly, trying to sort out the banks, the economy, and fourthly, trying to reform politics. And those four lodestars, if I can put it like that, in my case and in our case, but I think you'll find this quite a lot, became disproportionately important the more the kind of flack and the heat and the fury of everyday battle increased because they're the only things you can hold on to. Now, clearly, in my case, it didn't work, but it was incredibly important to be able to say, look, whatever else you might think, we stuck doggedly to deliver the things that we said were the most important things to us. And I think, in a really odd way, that there's, an odd, there's an irony there. The more frenetic and febrile politics feels, the more stubborn I expect politicians will become in at least sticking to the few things that they can, they can deliver. Thank you. Um, Nick's given us the cue with a desire for a much noisier 24-hour barrage of questions. So it's your turn. 
Um, you don't have to be personally attacking or rude, but uh, we'd love to have some insightful and challenging questions from all of you. So um, who would like to ask a question to Nicholas Cappy? Well, yes, please. Can you have a mic over there, please? If you could just give your name and, and, and where you come from, that would be really helpful. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for your presentations, Nick and uh, Catherine. Uh, my name is Benjamin, and I'm a law postgraduate student at Balliol College. And I was interested, given what both of you were saying about the frenetic pace of government and the fact that it's very difficult to deal with all that level of permanent noise, how constructive a role can strategy units or futures planning be for politicians making decisions or international negotiations that last very long? Are they actually useful, or do they provide sort of guidance that's more helpful for academics? Thank you. Another question, perhaps from over this side of the room. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Gavin Allen from the BBC. Um, I was interested in you saying about politicians get branded as um, bloodless, venal, and amoral. And you painted a picture of this idea that it's sort of politicians in this social media world and the noise is constant. Isn't that half the problem? A lot of it is politicians on politicians. It's not internal, external. And the, this whole theme of politicians demanding answers from each other much, much more quickly, undermining each other's uh, sense of noble endeavour and calling, you know, whether it's uh, Labour denouncing the Tories as they just want to crush the NHS, even though actually most, most media people, incredibly, think politicians are incredibly noble people and do, as you say, go out there for the best of reasons. <laughs> yeah, it's not work. It's not like... Very but specialist. But it is an important thing about just... It, politicians are slightly hoisted their own petard with the way they attack each other. The other thing is just very quickly, because the BBC always tries to get two questions into every time. It's a very quick one. It's very, I was just interested in, the, in your point about, I can't remember exactly what you said, but about the incredible incompetence uh, of the migration issue and the way that Europe responded to it. Was it then actually quite a competent thing to do for the various countries to put up these physical barricades, even though visually it looked terrible? Was it actually the right answer in the short term just to stop the migration to then get a longer, longer term response. Thank you. Uh, let's start with the practical question about stress units and futures units. Cathy. Um, I, think, I think they could be even more important than they are. And one of the reasons I'm involved in the school here, uh, and I'm also uh, doing some teaching at Yale, is because I'm really, really interested in how the extraordinary work done by academics and think tanks and so on could help the, the people thrust into the problem, as it were, who are having to deal with the practicalities of it, help them get a handle on forward thinking or understanding issues, perhaps from a different perspective. And my experience was I didn't really have much of that. Um, that, um, and that may be my fault, by the way, that maybe lots of stuff came in and I, d I was reading stuff all the time. But, but I think there's a, dis a real need to actually try and engage the two sides of it, you know, academia and practicality, without criticising either for being different to the other, to be able to give us more sense from each. So my hope is that more of us get engaged with um, academic life and more academic life gets engaged with us so that we can kind of swap what we know and how we do things. It won't affect the different role and relationships, but I, I genuinely think I would have uh, benefited, looking back, had I had the chance to have more of that strategic thinking. And because we were doing it day to day, we just couldn't have time to do that. Yeah, no, of course, of course uh, thinking you know, over the, beyond the brow of the next hill uh, uh, is incredibly important uh, in politics for, for the reasons that Cathy just explained, because you're so bound up with the here and now. Uh, I mean, it, but it needs, to, it needs to be good strategy. I mean, just because it's called strategy doesn't necessarily mean it's sensible. I mean, uh, I heard some so-called strategy stuff in Whitehall that I bought and still think it was absolute nonsense. Uh, uh, or, or I remember the time of the Ukraine crisis. I sort of searched in vain for someone in Whitehall who knew anything about Ukraine, because the strategic knowledge was gone. Uh, uh, in other instances, um, I remember at the time of the beginning of the Arab Spring, in fact, you and I spoke several times on the phone, I remember at the time, uh, the time of the Arab Spring. Uh, uh, the, the David Cameron and I created something called the National Security Council. He was the chair. He still is. Uh, uh, I was the vice chair. <laughs> I was, I was, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. Uh, I, I, was, I was the vice chair. I'm not anymore. Um, <laughs> 
we created this uh, National Security Council, which brought together the, the security agencies, the, the military people, the Foreign Office, the Ministry of Defence, and so on. We, so, we met every week for five years, half a decade. And I remember we brought in a bunch of academics and strategists about the Arab Spring. And uh, we can, or at least I concluded from that conversation, as I think Cathy did, that uh, this was a very, very important moment for Europe to seek to extend, much as we had done very courageously, in my view, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall in seeking to stabilize Central and Eastern Europe, both economically and politically, that we should try and do something equally ambitious uh, for the southern Mediterranean. But that would require very different decisions, dramatically increased market access for, say, to take a particularly controversial example, for agricultural products from, from North Africa. Uh, from, from North Africa. Um, and, and Cathy pursued that uh, as best as she could, as did I in government. But what I discovered was that whilst that was obviously the strategic, strategically the right thing to do, <coughs> there was just simply no political will <coughs> to make it happen. And in my view, we will look back on Europe's uh, penny-pinching response to the Arab Spring as a monumental strategic error. And we will spend years, if not decades, uh, facing the consequences of a, of a profoundly destabilized hemisphere now in the Mediterranean. Uh, in part, in part, because we didn't do something big and brave and strategic enough, which the strategists, to be fair, were telling us at, at the time. The, do, do we go? Yes, the banality, amor amorality, and <laughs> nobleness. And uh, nobleness. Uh, no, no, but you said it. We're all very noble. Uh, so, well, it's just... Uh, uh, no, just one thing, which, where I, of course, I, yes, of course, uh, uh, politicians, uh, particularly in a, in a sort of hothouse atmosphere like um, Westminster, and because of the uh, very, very kind of aggressive idiom of, of political debate in the United Kingdom, uh, you, you know, even the most mild-mannered uh, folk uh, end up sort of spluttering with red-faced rage at, at each other. Um, the, the whole system sort of built to, 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 to do that. The, the thing that I, where I, where I, perhaps more serious point, where I do think there is, where I think mainstream politicians are now skating on very, very thin ice, uh, and we're all guilty of it, and just as much as everybody else, and it is this, is that if you look at the way elections are increasingly fought, they are increasingly fought as, as, as sort of, as a sort of, as a dispute between tiny tactical differences. It's the sort of, it's the tyranny of sort of tactical campaigning rather than a, than, a, than, a, than, a, than a kind of clash of different um, competing perspectives on the future, which is what elections should, elections should be about the future. What do, you, what do you think? What are the big challenges you think the country faces? What can you do about it? Unfortunately, increasingly, and partly because of the professionalization of uh, election campaigns, focus groups, microcosmic messaging via social media, segmenting the population, and slicing and dicing the population in lots of different ways and, and you know, titillating this part of the population with that message and that other part. I mean, a very good example, by the way, and I don't say this in a sort of partisan way, was the appallingly cynical a Conservative campaign in the recent London mayoral election, where it was reduced extraordinarily to the Conservative Party sending leaflets to, hit, to families of, of the Hindu faith in London saying, your jewellery's not safe if the Labour candidate... I mean, it's just a, it was, thank God it, 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 it absolutely bombed the campaign. But it was, it was the kind of... For me, it was almost the apogee of where we're going on electioneering at the moment, which is you, have, you, you, you buy an incredibly expensive advice from people, by the way, who've never stood in an election themselves and barely have ever spoken to a voter, but apparently are supposed to be the high priests of how to win elections. And then they advise, in Zach Goldsmith's case gullible politicians to pursue very, very sort of cynical, tactical, divisive, thing, to try and corral together a few extra thousand votes. And that, quite understandably, really annoys people because people kind of do intuitively get that, that, that politicians should, should be trying to address bigger issues, you know, from to housing to the sustainability of our pensions, from climate change to terrorism to, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then the final thing, sorry, uh, uh, I'm taking too much time, but on the barriers. No, I don't think it's an act of competence that barbed wire has gone up on the Bremer Pass or whatever. I think it's an inevitable consequence of the uh, sort of design flaws of Schengen that because you don't have any, because you had no border controls anywhere, neither internally nor externally, 
And because it'll take some time for the European Union to get its act together to do what logically we should have done at the out, or they should have done at the outset in Schengen, which is have a proper and meaningful external uh, border checks if you're going to remove internal border checks. I think it is inevitable, not, not, not an act of competence, it is inevitable that what, what's going to happen now is you're going to have temporary internal borders until those uh, sensible external checks are put in place. I hope, it, I hope that's what will happen. And, then, and then the sort of dream, which is a really good dream, of, of, of borderless travel within Schengen can be resumed. But it clearly can't be resumed if you've got neither internal or external checks in place. Okay, further questions? Yes, please, gentlemen here in the blue and red top. If you could just give your name again and where you're from. Uh, Leo Kay, I'm a history student, second year. Um, I was wondering, uh, you talked about the importance of mutual trust and goodwill um, uh, in m facilitating multilateral negotiations, um, especially given the example uh, which uh, Mr. Clegg, you, you dropped about Ukraine. Um, how does one provide good leadership when there is mistrust and the desire to deceive by various parties? Um, by the Russian, Russian government. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> nice to have someone on leading the questioner. Um, <laughs> yes, please, in the middle. Um, uh, my name is Zainab Usman, doctoral candidate in international development, also here at the Robotnik School. Um, my question is uh, how do policy makers, or how should policy makers, overcome the crucial challenge of uh, policy capture by vested interests. So, uh, right, Honorable Clegg, this was something you mentioned, you know, there's that threat. But uh, I wasn't quite sure if any of you on the panel really elaborated on how this could be achieved. So you have a politician who goes into office with all these ideals on workers' rights or environmental standards, but then is confronted with the reality of yeah. multinational corporations, for instance, with their own interests and who are often more powerful. Uh, it just doesn't seem like perseverance, consistency, and persistence, as you all mentioned on the panel, is sufficient to overcome this problem of policy capture and to make sure that the right balance is struck. So that's one question. Hi, thank you so much for your insights. Uh, I'm Teddy from uh, the Blavatnik School. Uh, I'm doing my master's public policy here. As a student of public policy, I'd be interested in knowing, uh, from your perspective and your experience, what are the skills and abilities that you see lacking in today's generation of, of public policy leaders, perhaps that hinder the public policy process and, and, and skills that perhaps we as students should be cultivating and, and, and learning here? Well, and I was just making sure I understood That's who right. you thought were the people who were lying, because it's important, you know, in any conversation you can get it wrong, shall we say. Um, there's a whole lot of things to be said and written about what happened in Ukraine, and as you know, I spent a huge amount of time there, and I knew both Yanukovych and Poroshenko, Yatsenyuk, and so on. So um, I'm going to give you a kind of very tiny bit of that, but please don't think that that's the definitive response. And I want to say two things. One is that it's a very, very interesting example of going along with something and continuing with a piece of work that everybody, including uh, colleagues in Moscow, was completely aware was happening. And then discovering at the end of that process that we've walked into a problem that was not identified, not because we were asleep, but because in all of the conversations it had simply never materialized. And that's interesting because I'm sure in you know, hindsight, perfect vision and all that, when people trace back, there are moments when perhaps we might have picked that up, but it was not about being asleep. Second point is that the world looks to me how I think it is because of who I am and what I know and what I've done. And the world looks to everybody else from that perspective. So when I talked with colleagues, and I use that word advisedly, in Russia, on what they saw 
that was happening in Maidan, when I was in Maidan, the picture was entirely different. They were seeing something entirely different. And um, this is something I want to talk about with students actually here, because that's something I'm teaching about, is, is judgment and understanding about how people make judgments about situations is really, really important. Because knowing that they look at it completely differently does not make them people who are telling lies. It's that they see things that you don't see. They see, um, putting it, one very simple example, John McCain on a platform in Kiev, in Maidan, making a speech, makes people in Russia think, hello, why is a very key Republican senator standing in Maidan? So they then draw their own conclusions, or choose to, is the other thing. Where we have to get to is a better strategic understanding of what's happening. Two, I think there's a whole issue about how we collaborate more effectively on some of these issues. And three, and most importantly, I think it's about now trying to work out how we uh, move on. And that means not allowing wedges to be put in various places in order to prevent nations from moving forward in the way that they want, but equally an understanding of what that means in terms of what kind of relationships need to happen in the future. Because you have to, I think, on the, on the land that is Europe, think much, much longer term uh, than you would otherwise. Thank you, Patrick. Nick, vested interests, avoiding capture. So, um, I mean, there are lots of aspects to, to, to this, but the, the most important of all is to ensure that the political system is designed in a way that uh, securing and holding on to power uh, is not dependent on any vested interest, and that as much as possible, there is an open democratic contest that can't be distorted or manipulated by vested interest. Um, and there are lots of aspects to that. Um, the electoral system. Um, I, as uh, I sit sitting next to a peer of the realms, I say this somewhat gingerly, but I think it's crazy that we have a, a, a legislative chamber in this country where people are not elected. You know, that, 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 that always. Uh, no, I know Cathy agrees with me. Uh, uh, you know that that that's that clearly susceptible to influence of vested interest. But, but the biggest is money, in my view. The biggest is money in politics. As long as big money speaks in politics, you will always have the very real risk that vested interests have a distorting effect on, on politics. And uh, uh, it's clearly um, at its most extreme manifest in developed economies in the United States. But I'm afraid I fear that British politics is moving at a breakneck speed towards kind of an American, an American style um, over reliance on big money. Um, it is just not healthy that the Labour Party is so disproportionately dependent for its financial resources on vested interests. Trade, whether you like or dislike trade unions, they're a vested interest. They're explicit vested. They are there to they vest the interests of the, the working people. It is clearly deeply unhealthy to have the Conservatives massively outspend, massively outspend uh, other parties last year with so much money disproportionately coming from one sector, the financial services. It's not healthy indeed for the party that I led. We were so reliant, over-reliant on one or two very generous individuals, who in our case, one of them, many years ago, turned out to be a complete crook. All of that is really, really unhealthy. And, I, I, and, I, and I, one of the things I find incredibly frustrating is how difficult it is to persuade people here, and I'm talking about the UK now, I'm not pretending that I've got a great insight into other countries, that, 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 that a, little, a little bit of public funding, funding for political parties might just be a necessary sacrifice from the taxpayer's point of view to deliver a much cleaner politics. Because as long as politicians have to, and I did it for years, you go on bended knee to people. And you need the money. You can't run elections without money. You can't print leaflets. You, it's not a sort of charity. Someone has to be paid for all these leaflets. And, uh, almost, it, it, it costs. It costs. Um, uh, but so for me, I put right at the top of my list, certainly in Britain, the desperately urgent, long overdue need for uh, party funding reform. And uh, again, I don't want to say it in, his, in his sort of in his recriminatory way as it sounds, but every time there's been an effort to, to clean it up, and I, I tried about four years ago, 
the two larger vested interests in, in Westminster, the Labour and the Conservative Party, find a thousand one reasons why, why it can't be done. But as long as that's the case, we're always going to have a politics in this country which is too susceptible to the power and influence of vested interests. Thank you. So our question, which I'd like you both to have a crack at, if you would, um, what are the skills that are desperately needed in the next generation of policymakers? Um, well, I think, you know, this big challenge that I keep going on about, and I apologise for banging on about it, between the domesticity of the work that you do and the international nature of the problems that you face, whether it's just issues as obvious as climate change, uh, but it could be many other, uh, and is, many other issues. Um, and having ways in which people can have the opportunity before they find themselves to explore within their own political system and party and also explore uh, with people who've been in policy making or the civil service or whoever it is, depending on what country you're in, actually what that's going to mean. Uh, because I think it's so, so important. I think the second, it's not really a skill, but I think we need to look at what the instruments we've got that we can use are. So we have this sort of spectrum that I call it between isolation and engagement on any issue. You fully engage on some issues, you isolate on others. You, you deal with by either putting a person or a country in the freezer on the isolation side, and you spend your whole time on the engagement spectrum. And using the kind of instruments that will entice people to make changes. So if I just refer very quickly to Serbia and Kosovo, you know, for both of them, they knew that their people's future lay in the European Union. They needed access to the single market. They knew that their security would be best uh, met by being part of the EU. And lots of issues to do with borders and all of that would, in a sense, disappear to an extent internally, uh, bearing in mind what Nick has been saying, uh, uh, for them. And so the, the enticing part of that was that they could see that if they could find ways to do agreements, they would move their nations further forward on that. And so you have in your toolkit a bunch of stuff. Sanctions on the one hand, and I've led a lot of sanction debates in Europe and achieved sanctions where it's been necessary. Um, and I've led a lot of engagement uh, uh, for the European Union in, in other ways. But you need to rethink, in a sense, what else we've got that we can use. And it is about not throwing money at things, but the use of money, the use of resources to try and support dramatic change, and how do you do that? And it's also about how do institutions, governments, and so on, who have a requirement, and rightly, to use your money well, deal with countries where there isn't a government, where there are people who are desperately trying to make change, but who are not able to respond to you as a government would. And I've seen that particularly, by the way, in the beginnings of the crisis in Libya, where the challenge for many of us was how to actually do things for them, support them in what they were doing, when governments did not exist. And so thinking and rethinking that is going to be a big part of what the skill set is going to be of the future. So, firstly, there's as well the difference between a policy maker and a politician. They're not, they really aren't the same. I mean, politicians don't conceive of themselves as sort of policy geeks. Sorry, not the policy makers, policy geeks, you know what I mean. Uh, I, was, I was a policy maker, I was a policy geek before I went into politics, as Cathy knows. I worked as, a, as an official and a policy advisor to, thank you, to, uh, in, in, in Brussels, and to, to, to the European Commission, before going into elected office. But they're completely different skill sets. Completely, you know, if you're a policy maker, you need to, you know, you need to have, above all and everything else, you have to have sort of intellectual firepower and curiosity and voracious appetite for new ideas, to scour new ideas, to debate, to come up, you know, you need to be creative, all of those kind of things. A politician, you need to, above and beyond anything else, be able to live with very little sleep. Um, uh, you need to have a sort of gregarious interest in, in, in other people. You need to be able to switch from talking to Mrs. Miggins in 36 Orchard Close about her conflict with her neighbour about the overgrown Lilanda on her garden through to talking to Cathy about the Iran deal. You need, you, need to, you need to be able to string a sentence together in public, but you also need to be able to um, uh, also be able to sort of shut up and be sympathetic um, to people as well. They're completely different sort of skill sets. The, the, the thing that I think is 
the most precious asset in politics, in my view, that is often most uh, difficult for politicians to uh, nurture and develop, partly because of what we said earlier, just because of the sheer fretting, frenetic nature of things, is, um, and I think, Catherine, you mentioned it earlier, it's just is judgment. is the ability to make judgments and to do so calmly and quietly and not be pushed about and not simply repeat the last breath you heard and not be worried about what this vested interest or that newspaper is going to say, that you make a judgment that you think will stand the test of time. And, and that, is the, that, is, that is what, certainly as I get older, that's the more and more and more what I look in, what I, I look for from politicians. A little bit less whether they come from the right or the left or they've got this, this party label. Do I think they're people whose judgments I kind of just think will be taken in a way which is mature, which is thoughtful, which is decent, which is underpinned, underpinned by values that I recognise. And that, and that, uh, and that is a, a precious thing that you need, you, you need to be, and it's a very difficult thing to do that. You need to, you need to be able to create the space and the stillness, if I can put it that way, to, to take judgments on often very complex issues where you're dealing with, I certainly found, you're constantly dealing with decisions where there's no one decision which is nice. But you're constantly dealing with lots and lots of invidious choices, uh, none, none of which are very attractive. So, uh, of all the qualities, it might sound a bit trite, but of all the qualities that I think um, is most important and most at threat because of the nature of our modern politics is just the ability to, to deploy good judgment. Thank you. Catherine, you've got a question? I just wanted to agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do a lot, but, but, but absolutely seriously, that is, all of you make judgments all day long. Choose which computer to buy, which room to go, who to share a flat with if you're a student, who to stay with, leave, whatever. All day long you make judgments about all kinds of things. And if you are in a position where you are having to make judgments about what you do about some of the really big crises, you're doing the same process. You're working out what information you need, you're working out who you trust around you who can give you the information. You're working out the basis upon which somebody's given you a detailed set of ideas, what motivates them, what changes them. It's also back to the vested interest too, because understanding why people are telling you to do something is also really, really important. But it's the biggest thing that you do. And it's why, for me, the more that people have got breadth of experience and have a chance to have that, the more likely they're able to be made critical judgments, which is what you all, we all will do. Thank you very much indeed. So as we've done in the other sessions, I'd now like to call upon um, one of the students here at the school from the MPP class to summarise um, the discussion and draw out some key themes for us. So, uh, my name is Dominika Zavala, I'm an MPP student from Paraguay, and I want to thank you for such a fascinating talk on leadership, especially to us as students, um, and to know the uh, key toolkits that are needed. So we started off by um, discussing um, uh, first of all, the challenges uh, for government leaders, what were the, the main causes and the barriers, and then what was missing, and then how do we create those skills. Um, we identified, uh, firstly, uh, how politicians were unable to deal with the forces of globalization. And here we identified two main issues on the migration problems and the banking crisis. Um, also, uh, then how uh, constituents feel vulnerable um, with problems be, uh, uh, at this, in this situation, with problems beyond their control, and feeling that politicians are unable to solve these problems. Um, uh, what we identified that was blocking this was that myopia of politicians, the vested interests that undermine the capacity uh, of governments to be efficient in executing policy. Um, we also, uh, the speakers also spoke about uh, two cases one at the international level and one at the domestic level. At uh, the domestic level, the example of the pupil premium was given uh, and how important it was to draw on experiences to build the political space and to secure the required resources. At the international level uh, negotiations, uh, the, it was to highlight the importance of a measured approach and the things uh, to work with things uh, which are within our, our control to make secure that we know about the operational aspects, to move quickly, speedy with capacity, and also to have a patch and mend approach and how important it is to have a balancing act. And when we uh, 
on, on, on the terms of, uh, of the skills needed for the future leaders. Uh, it was um, highlighted uh, how important it is to, um, to identify the process, the structure, and collaboration to build trust and to understand the mission, uh, to identify those lone stars and to hang on to them, and to be living in your mission is especially important in our day and age because of um, the context of the noise that is created constantly by social media. And lastly, um, uh, it was identified that how, how important it is to uh, enable to uh, build those judgments and understand um, the vision, uh, especially in a situation of a negotiation, to understand the world of others and the view of others. Thank you very much. So on all of your behalf, um, I'd just really like to thank our two speakers. You both shared with us generously uh, of your own experiences. Uh, very few of us, if any, in the room have had the opportunity to serve at the levels that you've both served at, and you've been open and honest about uh, successes, occasionally failures. You've dealt very frankly with the questions that you've been asked, and it's been a, just a pleasure for us to learn from your experiences. So thank you both very much indeed. So ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I now have the pleasure to switch from the chair of this panel to your tour guide for the rest of the day. You now have an hour for lunch. I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, a bell will go in 55 minutes when you'll be encouraged to come back to this room for our next session. Thank you very much. <laughs>